right, there he is. We, uh, would you like to cross examine? I would certainly like to cross examine. Thank you, Your Honor, for money's acts for the defense here. Mr. President, would it have disappointed the oil companies who were your biggest supporters if you hadn't done everything in your power to try to take control of Iraq's huge oil reserves? <laughs> Mr. President, would you say the American people know what's best for them? <laughs> would you say that it's sometimes necessary to manipulate the American people into supporting policies that they don't realize are in their best interest? <laughs> Mr. President, if you hadn't lied to the American people about the supposed presence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, do you think you would have been able to get America to declare war on Iraq? Possibly. I see. Do you believe the Iraqis have the sense to handle all of that oil that was flowing under their soil? <laughs> do you believe that the Iraqis would have had the sense to be able to handle all that oil that was under their soil? No. Uh, that's what I thought. Uh, could we have risked having that oil fall into someone else's hands than ours if we hadn't acted when we did? Absolutely not. That oil, that oil is more than a crazy thing. Yes, so, all right. All right. Well, thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. All right. Thank you. If there are no further questions, you are excused, sir. Trip and fall. Prosecution is for the prosecution. Wait, it's for the, the defense. Yeah, we defense. Right. Please call your first witness. All right, I'd like to bring up Mr. Ahmed Habibi to the stand. <laughs> Mr. Habibi is here from Guantanamo. He's uh, taking a little break from his current uh, uh, circumstance and joining us here today. So we're very, very happy to have him. I think he will clarify things for all of you. Stand for a moment. Raise your right hand in the air. Please swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Stand there. This thing on. Yes, Mr. Mr. Abibi, thank you so much for coming. I'm really glad you were able to carry yourself away from everything that's going on with you right now. Um, Where am I? Uh, we're, we're in the courtroom, and uh, unfortunately, sadly, the uh, former president of the United States is on trial, and we're going to try to, it, it's an injustice, and we're going to try to rectify it right now. So I want to ask you some questions, Mr. Habibi. Mr. Habibi, what was your profession in Iraq? I was a cab driver. I see. Um, do you have any, did you have any dealings with Al-Qaeda? Never. Stay true. Do you know why you were taken into custody, Mr. Habibi? I, I have no idea. Habibi, it means friend. I was everybody's friend. Now I'm no one's friend. Mm, clearly you were somebody, not somebody's friend. So um, what were you saying first, after you were taken into custody? What happened? They put, they put a bag over my head and earmuffs my ears and loaded me into a plane. They put a diaper on me like a baby. They put they put drugs in my bottom that made me soil myself. I had to sit in my own filth for hours like a baby. I think we went to Germany. And then uh, where after that? Yeah. After Germany, there was uh, Egypt, I think, from the way they spoke. It's a terrible Arabic. Ah, you know, Egypt is one of the world's great guest, tourist destinations, Mr. Abidi. Uh, uh, would you have ever been able to afford a trip to Egypt on a cab driver's salary? A trip to Egypt? <laughs> My one dream was to someday take the Hajj to Mecca as Allah. That's very nice. Um, what do you say next, um, Mr. Abidi? Oh, Egypt. I was in Egypt a long time. They tortured me horribly. Violated me. I was raped and fixed and, and the tongue. Egypt, they are so focused on the bottom, they seem not to know it is a door of exit, not a door of entry. Well, you know, I, terrible. I never saw any of this in the brochures, you know, tourist brochures. But anyway, so after, after Egypt, where did they send you? This is the after Egypt, it was back to Europe, Eastern Europe, I don't know. Really? Uh, okay. Uh, they said that was goulash. Uh -huh. Awful. So you, you think it might have been Hungary or Romania? Or Somewhere. Uh, would, would you, in your wildest dream, ever have considered to go to go to Eastern Europe? Of 
do I look like? So that American politician's wife giving the, taking photo op, giving candy to starving children. So what, I cannot what? afford trips on it. Cab driver's salary. So Mr. Habibi would never have in his wildest dreams ever have had a chance to even consider going to in, in, in broadening his business and going to Europe. So after that, where did you go? Where, where were you sent? Northern Africa, I believe. Maybe Morocco. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What did they do there? They were in Morocco. It's not a Morocco Pumas. Not once. Wow, that's terrible. Uh, did you stay in Morocco? Or did, you, did you stay in Morocco or were you uh, somewhere else? All I remember from Morocco is the death roads on my genitals. Oh, horrible. The pain. These stars. Terrible. At least they didn't have that bottom obsession. That was a blessing. It's nice that they mixed it up a little for you, Mr. Habibi. Yeah. They switched to the front. Did you, um, did you stay in Morocco or did you end up somewhere else open the video? No, I live in Guantanamo. That's X-ray. Oh, oh in, in, in Cuba. Yes, yes I, I, I keep thinking of mojitos and palm trees. That's very nice. So, Mr. Habibi, what has been done to you at Camp X-Ray at Guantanamo? Hold the mic, Mr. Habibi, please. Oh. I can hear you. In, in, in Guantanamo, the, the Americans, they torture us, but differently. The Americans torture us with a smile on their face, like they are at a wedding. And they take pictures to take home to their friends and children to have a good laugh to see us naked and cringing. Yes, we are. The Americans are known as the friendly people, Mr. Habibi. That's part of that. Um, did you confess to any crimes after all that enhanced interrogation? I confess to everything. I confess to being the Laden's sister. <laughs> I, there is nothing I would not tell them to make them stop. I see. Would you say that you told your interrogators exactly what they wanted to hear? I told them everything they wanted to hear and more. Were you guilty of any of the things you told me? No, I am guilty of nothing. Yes. I am an honest, clean living man. I once was a man, now I am nothing. Well, how, how do you feel these days? Well, have you experienced any adverse effects from the way you've been treated? I feel awful. I cannot sleep at night. The slightest, the slightest noise and I wake up screaming. <laughs> it's terrible. Oh, wow, that sounds awful. Um, do you think that you could easily, in the state you're in, return to your old life and just pick up where you left off, just like that? I cannot. I have been dishonored. No. I'm not a man anymore. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bibi. That was nice. Um, I hope you have a nice flight back to Guantanamo, and I have no further questions. Will there be an insight view? Uh, possibly peanuts. <laughs> in prosecution, you may cross-examine the witness. Mr. Habibi. Uh, did you ever tell, were you ever told what you were accused of? Never. I have no idea why they feel I have harmed them, these people, these devils. Did you ever receive a consultation with a lawyer? A lawyer? I asked for a lawyer. They told me I have not been arrested for anything. Six years I have been in jail and I have not been arrested. What? What's that about? <laughs> have you been seen by a doctor? Yes, so many doctors. They would torture me till I, till I passed out, and then they would send in a doctor to make sure I was healthy enough for more torture. But no pain relief, oh no. Would you like to elaborate on the torture that you received at Guantanamo? I was made to stand in uncomfortable positions for hours and hours. They would not let me sleep. They would play loud music that would not let me sleep for days at a time. What is Iron Maiden? And why do they scream all the time? I don't understand these things. <laughs> Terrible. Have you been told what your release date is? Release. The guards, they tell me I will never be released. I think they are right. If you are released, are you going to go back home? I cannot go home. My neighbor, you see, I, I leave. He has taken over my house. He uses my wife as a servant and my daughters as armchairs. I cannot go. I have no home. I am now a citizen of the world, a refugee of the world. I have no one. Where are, what country am I in now? I don't know. They blindfold me, load me on a plane. I don't know where they take me. Someday they will throw me away.
Thank you, Mr. Habibi. That's, that's all the questions here. I do have one question, Mr. Habibi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you say you can't go home, you don't know when you'll be released. What are your thoughts about your condition? Nothing. I am the stain on the bottom of the shoe of the world. It's great off on the curve. Where, where would I go? Who would accept me now? Everyone thinks I am their enemy. I am no one's enemy. I am Ahmed Habibi, the friendly cab driver. I have nothing. Thank you. You are excused. I will say that the purpose of the court is to do the people's business, bring justice to the people, and we will find a way to bring justice to Mr. Habibi. That is beside the point in this case. We're still going to carry on with the trial of the people versus George W. Bush. And I now ask the prosecutor to make their closing statement. As I've proven here, uh, George Bush <laughs> is definitely guilty of uh, murder. He falsely declared that Iraq and Saddam Hussein were hoarding uh, weapons of mass destruction. And uh, he had he implemented uh, the, the new policy of the United States administration where we kidnap and then send to kidnap uh, civilians what they decide, randomly decide, as guilty terrorists to other countries and uh, begin the torture process and they send them country to country which specializes in different uh, torture tactics and eventually they end up in Guantanamo. So I say to ladies and, jury, ladies and gentlemen of the jury to find Mr. Bush guilty and sentence him to murder Thank you, ma'am. Defense, your closing statement. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, President Bush stands here being accused of extraordinary rendition, enhanced interrogation, indefinite detention, and spying on Americans. Let's break down each of the charges, shall we? Oh. Extraordinary rendition. This is really, a, at its heart, a cultural exchange. Accused terrorist from country A is taken to country B by us, country C, and uh, often taken to country D and E as well. They never in their wildest dreams would ever have had a chance to travel to them too. And it's also a cultural exchange in the sense that our security apparatus gets to work intimately with the security apparatus in places as far flung as Egypt, Morocco, Romania. We learn so much from each other. You know, we've really had the waterboarding thing down since the Spanish-American War. But beating people with the rods on the salt of their feet, that's, and that's a Turkish thing. We learned when we worked with the Turks. I mean, it's really great. Our guys go over there, they, they learn some words of the language, they eat some of the food. Those people get to find out why the Americans are called the friendly people. It's, it's really a great thing. And also, it's about building relationships. You know, we are trying to develop relationships with people in the field, in these countries that we're operating in. So, for instance, let's imagine there's a fellow named Ali, who's a Shiite who lives in a neighborhood with one Sunni family in Baghdad, and he doesn't like the Sunni family, and the, uh, the Sunni fellow is named Ahmed Habibi, a cab driver, who hasn't done anything for anybody, but he does have a nicer house than Ali. Let's imagine that Ali is resentful. Ali calls us up, calls up our security apparatus, and tells us that he's a terrorist. Now, we're trying to build a relationship with Ali. Ali is someone we value. He's somebody in the field. So it's, it's a shame that Mr. Ahmed Habibi gets the nasty end of the stick, but, uh, you know, heads have to roll to achieve what we're trying to achieve, which is a, um, a great relationship with somebody. So Ahmed gets a tour of all these exotic places, and, and Ali is somebody that we can count on because he knows that he can count on us. So that's, that's important. Now, that's the first thing. Uh, intense interrogation. Now, it is true that torture is a terrible way of getting actual information from anybody. But it's a great way of getting people to say exactly what you want them to say. So while we're waterboarding people and keeping them up nights and depriving them of any sensory input, we're able to get them to confess to any kind of crime we want. And what's nice about that is it's about saving the face of Ali, our friend back in Baghdad. What if we were to let Mr. Ahmed Habibi out? And if he's innocent, it would look very bad for Ali. He would be branded alive. But by getting Mr. Ahmed Habibi to confess to just anything he could possibly think of, Ali feels validated, 
and it's a winning relationship. And, uh, you know, we know he's not a terrorist. Ofsted knows he's not a terrorist, but uh, by the time we're done with him, he's going to confess to the fact that he uh, sunk the uh, Titanic and is killed the Archduke Ferdinand. So, um, and uh, let's talk about intent, uh, indefinite detention. Here's the thing. We need to keep Guantanamo going. If we were to close that down, the Cubans would spread their godless communism to even more land. We just can't let that happen. But the other thing is, after what we've done to Ahmed Habibi, if he were to get out, and he were to tell people about what happened to him in Egypt and Morocco and Romania, and then at Camp X-Ray, Guantanamo Bay, it would be very, very adverse to the brand that is the United States. We can't afford to let that happen. And in fact, it's actually in everybody's best interest, because Mr. Habibi, if he were to be sent home, imagine his family is trying to watch Iraq's got talent, and Mr. Habibi is in the corner, keening and wailing and moaning and crying and shaking. They're not going to be able to enjoy anything. Everybody's trying to sleep at night, and the sight is sound, and he's shrieking. Really, it just will make everybody, it will harsh their mellow in such a bad way. So I, I think this is really, let's keep the status quo. He's doing fine where he is. And the one other thing is spying on Americans. You know, the fact is, the best way to prevent patriot, uh, terrorist acts is merely to use good old-fashioned police work. However, by getting you folks to queue up at the airport and the x-ray and pat it down, we can cultivate an atmosphere of fear so you won't even blink when we take away more of your civil liberties. And uh, so it, it's really, it's kind of important because, because it's not really, we're not monitoring your cell phone use and your library books because we're really trying to catch terrorists. We're doing it because Pfizer wants to know what your blood cholesterol is. And you can wants to know if you've got a new puppy. And that's where all this information is going. We're not really looking for terrorists. So this is really about the American economy, and everyone knows the American economy needs a boost right now. So there can be no doubt that Mr. Bush's administration did all of these things, but really, were they really crimes or great deeds? A not guilty verdict will send a very powerful message that Mr. Bush doesn't deserve our approbation and punishment, but instead our appreciation and praise. I hope you'll do the right thing and acquit my client. You've heard the charges. The defendant is charged with extraordinary rendition, torture, indefinite detention, and spying on Americans. You've heard statements from both the prosecution and defense. You've heard from witnesses given evidence and testimony, very compelling on both sides. I now ask the jury to carefully consider the evidence given, to retire, and to consider the verdict. Mr. Foreman, you give your mic to this. Okay, now, you guys are the jury. We the people and the jury. So, uh, I'd like to take a, I'd like to take a temperature check. Can anybody hear me? All right, now we the people are going to do the jury. Uh, we're going to take a temperature check on what you guys believe you think he should be found guilty of the charges that he's being accused with or not guilty. We'll take one for guilty. You can put your fingers in the air if you think he's guilty. Hey! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> do, we have, do we have to vote on not guilty? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see. Oh, not guilty! <laughs> oh. 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 oh! I'm sorry, I think this is a, a paid officer. Can you somebody else put him out of here? Come back to the judge and give him a verdict. We have a verdict. Yeah. 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 Off with his head. Yeah, off with his head. How do you say? Castrate. Your Honor, the, the, the jury finds the defendant guilty as hell. <laughs> Hey.
guilty. Guilty. Raising this point that you've been found guilty by this jury, I remand you to the custody of the bailiff, and we will come back at a time uh, to consider an appropriate sentence for you. 100 years from now. And I think the date of that uh, sentencing will be April 1st. He's too time. Thank you, please. Let's hang him from right there, right now. Let's hang him right now. On behalf of defense, oh, I have to say I'm a little disappointed with all of you, however... Not half as much we're disappointed in you. Yeah. Uh, can we get some help on this boat well, here? Somebody, you know... Bring in the poor boys, they know. Anyway, we're very disappointed, but you know, here's the thing. So, the puppet was taken into custody, but I want to assure you that the hand that goes up the puppet's bottom easily can find more puppets, yeah. and we are going to continue to do that, so don't worry, the system will not fail you. You can count on us.